So welcome to part two of our first lecture on ancient civilizations and we now turn to developments in ancient Egypt, the other great civilization of the Near East centered along the Nile River Valley. And in many ways we're going to see uh, similar patterns that we've already encountered in Mesopotamia, but there are some important differences. Uh, you know, in terms of how this civilization first emerged, we're pretty sure what happened early on is people started to concentrate uh, in the Nile Valley as the climate of northern Africa became increasingly hot and dry. It might surprise some people to know that the Sahara Desert was once not a desert, right? So in the period leading up to Egyptian civilization, uh, we start to see desert, uh, desertification of that area and people kind of conglomerating around this kind of, you know, green fertile uh, strip running through the desert in Egypt around the Nile River. And, you know, this was a very ideal uh, region for the development of an agricultural uh, centralized society, right? So first of all, and this is where you do have a significant difference from Mesopotamia, the Nile is fairly predictable, right? So uh, it does flood, but it does it pretty much in the same way every year at the same time. Right, so very predictable. Uh, Nile, you know, and, and kind of corresponding to that, the forces of nature are seen as being kind of more life enhancing rather than life threatening. And so that is gonna have some bearing even on religious developments. Uh, another very important factor is the Nile River serves uh, to kind of, you know, unify the various points along it, right? It's very easy to move up and down the Nile and feel connected. Right, even from, uh, you know, if you're talking about settlements developing in the northernmost part of Egypt, what's often referred to, by the way, as Lower Egypt, Upper Egypt is further south into the interior, up river, going up the Nile. Uh, but it's very easy for people to move back and forth, right, and develop kind of a shared, uh, you know, kind of idea of culture and being part of the same society and so forth. At the same time, you know, the Nile River, the Nile Valley is surrounded by desert, right? Uh, or, you know, to the north, by the, you have the Mediterranean Sea. So, uh, in a way, allowed to, uh, civilization allowed to develop unmolested there uh, because you have these natural barriers, right? The desert, the sea, and so forth. So, not being subjected to attack from other people. People, uh, in the case of Mesopotamia, very often people are just passing through. Now, when we talk about the history of ancient Egypt, we tend to divide it into three major periods, collectively made up of 31 dynasties, right? 31 ruling families in total. And these periods are the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom. And by the way, this way of breaking down Egyptian history is actually borrowed from the ancient Egyptians, uh, Egyptians themselves. By the time you get to the New Kingdom, uh, Egyptians, looking back at their own history, broke it down exactly this way. Uh, added to that, we, we very often refer to the periods in between, which were characterized by instability, uh, as intermediate periods, where things kind of broke down, but then eventually, uh, somehow, Egyptians were able to pull it together and initiate a new period of glory and flourishment. So we might look at each kingdom in turn. The Old Kingdom, running from 2686 to 2181 BCE. Uh, and, you know, each kingdom uh, has very specific characteristics that really distinguish it from the other kingdoms, right? In the Old Kingdom, probably the most, uh, you know, distinctive characteristic is that this is the period that saw the construction of the Great Pyramids, right? So most people are familiar with the pyramids, strong association with ancient Egypt. Uh, but what a lot of people don't know is that all of these pyramids were built during the Old Kingdom, right? After the Old Kingdom, they discontinued the practice. Uh, you know, certainly these are monumental structures, reflect the availability of surplus resources both in terms of material and human resources, uh, indicative of a very productive and stable economy that enabled the state to sponsor the construction of these colossal monuments, right? It's not just pyramids. There are other monumental works, exceptional works of art and so forth. Uh, the pyramids in particular, but, but many of these monuments, symbols of the authority of the pharaohs, right? The pyramids themselves actually served as their burial chambers. Right, so the actual chambers are relatively small, 
compared to the overall structure at the center, you know, clearly the, the pyramids are designed to draw attention uh, to the ruler buried there. And probably most famous are the Great Pyramids, which you see in this image here. Uh, what I love about this image, right, it really has the appearance that the pyramids are out there in the middle of the desert. Uh, I don't know if it's apparent, way to the, uh, to the right of the pyramids, right, just there's a little bit of space there before the image comes to an end, you can actually see some modern structures. The pyramids are actually right on the outskirts of Cairo, right? But in any event, I mean, they're quite monumental. Uh, they were, you know, much smoother surfaces back in the day. They were uh, mined for materials in the centuries, uh, uh, you know, after uh, the end of the ancient Egyptian civilization. Uh, but, but these, you know, were designed to really, uh, you know, kind of a propaganda, you know, to glorify the rulers. And the pharaohs were understood as gods, right? So the, the pharaohship is a divine institution. The pharaohs had absolute power. Uh, but you know, it's funny, when, when we say that, it doesn't mean they could act in an arbitrary way, right? There was kind of the idea that they should rule according to set principles. And their primary function, uh, in some ways, even more important than governing, making you know, kind of more conventional uh, decisions about how to run Egyptian society, you know, how to manage the economy and so forth, uh, was to maintain the cosmic order, right? So pharaohs played a very prominent role in a host of rituals. And it was very important that they conduct themselves accordingly. Otherwise, you know, the cosmic order could be thrown out of sync and they would be held accountable for the ensuing chaos, right? The chief principle underlying all of this was something called ma'at, a spiritual concept that conveyed the idea of truth and justice and so long as the pharaohs adhered to this principle, right? I mean, that they were the living manifestation of it, that they governed according to it, uh, it would preserve the world in harmony. So, I mean, that pretty much uh, highlights, I, I think, probably the main points associated with the Old Kingdom eventually coming to an end uh, in 2180. And from that point up until 2055 BCE, you have what's known as the first intermediate period where things kind of fell apart, right? We're not entirely sure exactly what brought about the collapse. Uh, probably a host of factors. Uh, there would appear to have been food shortages uh, and that led to famines uh, and then to political strife between different rival factions, which resulted in small scale civil wars and eventually the collapse of central government, right? So you have during this period, uh, a number of smaller kingdoms that emerged, Egypt becomes politically fragmented, uh, but eventually reunited by a king from the city of Thebes, uh, a fellow named Mentuhotep, who initiates the Middle Kingdom, right? So the Middle Kingdom is in some ways, perhaps uh, the period during which Egyptian culture is going to most flourish, right? Where uh, you know, whatever, whatever kinds of developments that were underway during the Old Kingdom pretty much become consolidated. Very prosperous period, high level of stability. Uh, first order of business was uh, the recovering of lost territory. But probably what characterizes the Middle Kingdom more than anything is that, that it is a period that sees a resurgence of art, literature, and monumental building pro uh, projects. And uh, like if I, I were going to ask you this on the exam, probably the most important development, what you might call the democratization of religion, right? So when the pharaohs were buried in, you know, in these chambers, right, in the, in the pyramids, it was kind of, you know, kind of tied in with ideas the Egyptians had about an afterlife, right? And he would have been buried with many different artifacts, uh, even with his servants and so forth. Uh, you know, the things that uh, it was felt he would need in the afterlife, right? But, but the afterlife really during the Old Kingdom was primarily for elites, for the pharaohs, maybe members of his family, you know, very important government bureaucratic figures, but really that would have been about it. Uh, you know, certainly kind of, you know, high ranking officials in the army. Uh, but most people weren't perceived as having, uh, you know, some kind of afterlife. During the Middle Kingdom, you know, th these ideas about the afterlife are going to now apply pretty much to everyone. All people are understood as possessing a soul and have the potential for achieving an afterlife. And related to this, you're going to see, th see the spread of mummification, right? Mummification, 
previously reserved for very important individuals, right? The idea that, you know, also in the afterlife, you would need to somehow preserve their physical body. This practice now becomes commonplace. Uh, and certain religious ideas are going to become very pr uh, prominent in connection with the afterlife, probably the most important having to do with the gods Osiris and Isis, right, who are brother and sister and husband and wife. And by the way, it was a very common practice in ancient Egyptian for pharaohs to marry their sisters, right? So uh, the basic deal is Osiris is going to be a symbol of resurrection and a judge of the dead. He's going to decide who would actually achieve an afterlife, right? So there's a whole myth connected with him uh, where at some point he is killed by his brother Seth and then cut up into little pieces, uh, he, he, which he tosses into the river, into the Nile. And then his uh, sister slash wife Isis recovers the pieces, stitches him back together, and he is in effect reborn, right? And because of this experience, he has the responsibility now for judging the dead. Uh, so basically, when you die, you will approach the throne of Osiris. Usually Isis is depicted as standing behind him, as in this image here. Uh, and then your soul will be weighed in a scale, right? And if it's lighter than a feather, uh, then, then good news. You're going to have uh, a, a wonderful afterlife, right? It's going to be like paradise. But if your soul is heavier than a feather, and the weight uh, is reflective of the various sins you committed in your life, uh, then you will be cast into the flames of hell, in effect, right? So you will be destroyed. Uh, so, you know, by the way, one last thing to note, it is interesting, this idea of resurrection, which is going to become a, uh, a theme that reappears in different religions, probably most famously in Christianity. Not saying that means that you know, the one uh, somehow led to the other, that it was an influence. Uh, it could reflect, uh, you know, a kind of archetype that is common in all human societies about uh, kind of the nature of reality, maybe reflective of the cycle of the seasons and so forth, but it is kind of interesting to note. Now, uh, looking beyond Osiris and Isis, during the Middle Kingdom, the most important god is going to be the sun god, Ray. And the Pharaoh is going to be connected to him. The Pharaoh is considered his earthly embodiment. Uh, so the incarnation of Ray, but also taking the title son of Ray. Uh, again, we find a similarity uh, to Christianity in this. You know, Jesus Christ often uh, understood as being both the incarnation of God on earth, but also the son of God. Uh, in any event, in the case of Ray, the city of Heliopolis, which is actually its Greek name, and that is kind of the... Uh, the tradition now to refer to it by that name, meaning Sun City, that becomes the center of a very important sun cult associated with Ray. Now, uh, in connection with the flourishment of the arts and literature and so forth, Egyptian art is going to uh, take its definitive form during the Middle Kingdom, right? Now, first of all, uh, we should note that uh, most Egyptian art had a purpose, right? It wasn't art for the sake of art. It was largely functional, right? So very often, uh, for instance, if you were in the tomb of a king, you would see many paintings uh, that actually provided direction for the soul, you know, after death about how to make it to the afterworld, right? Uh, very often, uh, the, the various images that one finds are connected with rituals aimed at preserving the cosmic order, right? But they have a functional purpose, right? It's not just simply because they look beautiful or for the you know, decorative purposes. And related to that, uh, Egyptian art is very formulaic. If you become an Egyptian artist, this is not about your own personal vision. You are expected to conform to certain patterns of art, right? Egyptian art, very formulaic. Artists and sculptors expected to conform to a strict canon Right? There are very strict rules about the kind of forms you use, about the proportions. Uh, and this is partly uh, the reason why Egyptian art today is so recognizable. Right? Even if uh, someone knows very little about ancient Egyptian history, if you show them Egyptian art, right, various images, th they probably would recognize it as being Egyptian. Right? Probably the most recognizable feature is this kind of combining of a profile, semi-profile, and frontal view when depicting the human body, right? Where their you know, feet are kind of pointed sideways, 
uh, but the bodies are kind of uh, facing forward and the heads are also pointing sideways. Uh, you, some of you might be familiar with the famous song, Walking Like an Egyptian, right? So, you know, very recognizable. And again, you know, kind of tying into the fact that Egyptian art had a functional purpose. And of course, related to Egyptian art uh, is Egyptian writing. We talked about cuneiform writing in the case of Mesopotamia. In the case of ancient Egypt, uh, the, the writing is known as hieroglyphics, which is actually a Greek term, right? So it's kind of a borrowed word, literally meaning priest carvings or sacred writings, does kind of reflect the idea that writings were considered to have, or letters considered to have kind of a sacred quality. Much like cuneiform, we don't have here a phonetic alphabet. Uh, you know, the various signs depict objects and then you combine the different signs to depict new objects or abstract ideas or verbs and so forth. Uh, but again, all the signs are considered as having a sacred value. Uh, and you know, that kind of ties in with the, the fact that uh, you would have had, in order to become a scribe, you would have had to have a very extensive education, right? This is a highly specialized skill uh, and those who who were able to to master it would have would have been highly respected now we're able to read both cuneiform and hieroglyphic writing uh, in the case of hieroglyphs it's kind of interesting to consider how that came about because uh, you know at some point nobody is using uh, either the ancient egyptian la language or hieroglyphics to write right with the end of uh, ancient egyptian civilization uh, you know, ancient Egyptian eventually became a dead language and hieroglyphics kind of a dead writing system. And at some point, really, no one knew how to read them, right? If you're talking about, say, uh, the 18th century, if you were a scholar coming from Europe, uh, anything you knew about ancient Egyptian, you had to surmise from the archaeological record. You did not have the ability to read hieroglyphics. Uh, and, and by the way, this is often a problem when studying ancient civilizations, right? Because, you know, these languages end up becoming dead languages. Nobody speaks them anymore. Nobody knows how to read them. So how did they figure out how to read hieroglyphics? Well, what happened, uh, some of you might be familiar with the fact that in the late, very end of the uh, 18th century, a fellow named Napoleon invaded and occupied Egypt uh, with his French army. And along the way, uh, a French soldier stumbled across a stone uh, that had the same ins inscription in three different languages. He found the stone in a village called Rosetta, hence why it is referred to as the R Rosetta Stone. Now this uh, stone tablet, the inscriptions on it, were actually written in 196 BCE, and it basically repeats the same passage in three languages. Two are in Egyptian, in the Egyptian language, uh, one, one, in one case written in hieroglyphics, in another case written in Greek letters, and then uh, the third passage is in actual Greek, right? So people, you know, uh, even up until now, people are able to read uh, even ancient Greek. It's not that, that different from modern Greek. Uh, so they could clearly read the passage in Greek. They could then read the uh, Egyptian passage uh, that was written in Greek letters. Right, uh, and because they know that it says the same thing, they were eventually able to determine, uh, you know, how to actually read the Egyptian script in Greek letters, and then from there they were able to work out how to read hieroglyphics. In a way, it's kind of like cracking a computer code, and it, it was very hard. It took a team of British and French scholars uh, to decipher the hieroglyphic symbols uh, through a comparison of the three languages, the three passages. The end of the Middle Kingdom will be a bit more dramatic than the ending of the Old Kingdom. It will actually involve the uh, invasion uh, and occupation of Egypt by a foreign people, Asiatic immigrants who had moved into the Eastern Delta and then eventually seized control of the region uh, around 1650 BCE. And some of this reflected the fact that by then the pharaohs had become somewhat weak uh, and therefore were ripe for the picking. So the Hyksos will actually adopt Egyptian government, uh, Egyptian forms, use of the Egyptian language, uh, Egyptian customs, so forth, but they will never be perceived as Egyptian by the indigenous population, right? They're perceived as foreigners, uh, and eventually the Egyptians rise up against them, uh, defeat and expulse them 
uh, from Egypt, and that marks the beginning of the New Kingdom period. Uh, so one interesting aside in connection with the Hyksos, uh, some of you might be familiar with the biblical account of the Hebrew slaves, uh, you know, who supposedly uh, had built the pyramids, many of the, of the, the great monuments, and, and then eventually were liberated by the prophet Moses. Uh, what's interesting is you find absolutely nothing in the Egyptian historical record corresponding to that. No indication or reference to uh, Hebrew slaves. Uh, some historians have speculated that maybe the Hyksos actually were the Hebrews, uh, you know, and that uh, just known by a different name uh, in Egypt. Uh, the timing doesn't quite work out with the biblical account. I mean, to the extent we consider the biblical account as having uh, any kind of historical accuracy. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to that later. We're, we're going to, when we get to the uh, second chapter, we'll talk about the Bible as a historical document. Uh, but in any event, right, just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Thought you might find it interesting. We now turn to the New Kingdom, which runs between 1550 1070 BCE. And this kingdom is defined, probably its chief characteristic is that during this period, Egypt uh, is very active imperialistically, right? In the sense of imperialism, meaning empire building, right? Related to which the military becomes the central priority for pharaohs. And during this period, Egypt is going to extend its influence both north and south into Syria to the north, uh, Nubia to the south, in some cases by directly occupying territory, uh, in other cases through diplomatic means and, and more just simply a matter of exerting Egyptian influence. But, but this is, in many, again, in many ways kind of the defining characteristic of the New Kingdom. Which is not to say that you don't have some impressive monuments being built during this period. A really good example would be the temple at Karnak right, uh, which is, you know, kind of a large scale building project uh, devoted to the god Amun uh, and centered around his cult. And, you know, if you were actually standing in front of these statues, uh, you would barely rise up to the, uh, a little bit above the platform, right? Th these are quite large. I've actually had the pleasure of visiting it. Uh, so, you know, still pretty impressive. This is also evident uh, with respect to burial chambers. They don't have pyramids, uh, but in many cases, uh, in many cases, uh, by this point, pharaohs are being buried in an elaborate network of caves not far from Karnak. Uh, but in some cases, uh, you have what might be called a mortuary temple, kind of a temple slash burial chamber, as in the case of Hatshepsut. Uh, who is also very interesting as uh, maybe the only female uh, pharaoh in the history of ancient Egypt. And um, that, that would have been tough going, right? So most historians feel that the purpose of this particular monument and others like it uh, was to provide a kind of propaganda to legitimize her claim to the throne, right? So, you know, again, this kind of elegant mortuary temple built at Karnak, probably the most impressive of these monuments. Uh, but, but, you know, the idea, so like very often uh, images of Hatshepsut would often show her with a beard and so forth, right? It's kind of a way of uh, distracting from the fact of her being a woman, something that in theory probably should have disqualified her from being a pharaoh. Uh, in any event, her successor, Tutmosis III, would seek to erase her legacy. Uh, possibly he was just ticked off that she had actually taken the throne away from him. He should have been the next in line. Uh, he was both her nephew and stepson. Uh, and, and by the way, this is also not an uncommon practice in ancient Egypt that when a new pharaoh takes the throne, uh, they, they might try to eliminate the images and inscriptions uh, referring to another pharaoh that uh, they, they take issue with for whatever reason, right? Just in a sense to erase them from history. Uh, you know, by the way, that, that has been one explanation offered for why there's no uh, reference to the Hebrews. You know, maybe the Egyptians were very embarrassed that uh, a slave caste had risen up uh, and, and had actually in some fashion won, right? So uh, possible, but, you know, usually uh, something, is, you know, something is often left behind in the historical record, right? Like we do know about Hatshepsut uh, in spite of Tutmosis' attempts at uh, kind of eliminating any reference to her.
And this brings us to what might be the most interesting development in, uh, during the New Kingdom, maybe uh, throughout the history of ancient Egypt, uh, the emergence of what might have been a very early form of monotheism, though it's really hard to say for sure, right? Monotheism you know, is more than simply the idea that you have like one really super powerful God, right? It's the idea that there is only one God might have been the former more than the latter. In any event, uh, it all begins with the new pharaoh, Amenhotep IV, who ascended to the throne in 1350 BCE uh, and immediately instituted some very radical and what would prove to be very chaotic reforms. Right? He, he took this kind of obscure sun god, Aten, and promoted the idea that he was a kind of supreme deity, right? and changed his name to Achenaten, which in a sense kind of meant servant of Aten. Uh, and then, you know, at the same time, suppress the worship of other deities and try to uh, really diminish the power of the priestly establishment, which was connected uh, with these many other gods, in particular, Re. He then moved the capital to a newly built city that he called Achetaten. Achetaten, the problem was, right, he became so involved with promoting this, you know, kind of pseudo monotheistic religion centered around this god, Aten. Uh, inclusive of building a new capital that he pretty much ignored all other aspects uh, of government, right? Ignored foreign affairs. He was just totally absorbed in this new religion and related to it a kind of new artistic style. Uh, and so, you know, in a sense, uh, you know, he lost credibility and, and with that, the new religion also, you know, really never took off. After his death, the cult of Aten was quickly abandoned. Uh, and there was, you know, this is another good example where there was an attempt to erase all mention of Achenaten's heresy, right? But also a good example of how they, they failed to eliminate all references, right? So we do know about this particular episode in ancient Egypt. You know, finally, we should know uh, the individual who possibly because of, of the fact that he's referenced in the Bible might be the, the most famous uh, Egyptian pharaoh of all time, and that would be Ramses II, or the Great, ascended the throne in 1279 BCE. Uh, you know, pretty effective as a pharaoh, right? So a lot going on in terms of the beautification of ancient Egypt, building temples, statues, obelisks. Uh, this, this temple here that you see, uh, probably the most famous, it might interest some people to know that when they constructed the high Aswan Dam in Egypt in, in the 20th century, right? Uh, you know, very often when you build a dam, you end up flooding a, a large area of land behind the dam, right? It kind of creates a, a big lake. Well, uh, this temple would have been submerged by the lake created by this new dam. So they actually had to disassemble the temple of Ramses II, create it, move it, and then rebuild it. So rather impressive project, uh, you know, kind of modern day project. Uh, we might also know Ramses II, famous for siring more children than any other pharaoh in history. There's a bit of a joke in Egypt uh, that pretty much everyone today can claim to have, uh, in some fashion, descended from Ramses II, right? So, uh, you know, this probably would have, would have reflected well on him as a pharaoh, you know, his masculinity and so forth. And, uh, you know, one very interesting development during the reign of Ramses II, uh, we have evidence of the first recorded peace treaty in history in 1258 BCE, right? And this is when Ramses II led his army against the Hittites from the north uh, in the Battle of Kadesh, which basically ended up a stalemate. Kadesh located in, uh, in what roughly corresponds to modern day Israel, Palestine. Uh, and it was a draw, right? The, the fighting uh, came to an end uh, basically as a stalemate uh, and it resulted in a peace treaty where they basically divided up the ter territory between them uh, into respective spheres of influence. In any event, uh, as happened with the previous kingdoms, the new kingdom eventually coming to an end though, uh, in this case, kind of a long drawn out affair, uh, basically, Egypt's wealth made it a target for invasion, right? And they started being subjected to uh, attacks from uh, the Libyans in North Africa, from a group known as the Sea Peoples. We're not quite sure who they were, uh, but probably coming down from the northern Mediterranean. Uh, and then, you know, you had other problems internal to Egypt, corruption, tomb robbery, civil unrest, 
all of this bringing about Egypt's decline, uh, you know, eventually being subjected to attacks by the Assyrians, who we're going to learn about in the next lecture, uh, and then eventually conquered by the Persians, finally by uh, Alexander the Great. Uh, and you're really going to have from that point forward a long period, hundreds and hundreds of years during which uh, Egyptians will not govern themselves, right? They won't govern themselves until the 20th century. Uh, probably the last foreign occupying power will be the British, uh, but it will be the last in a long line of them. Uh, but in any event, that uh, kind of brings us to the end of our discussion of ancient Egypt. So we're going to finish this lecture uh, by briefly looking at one other people, the Hittites, who were based in what today roughly corresponds to the modern state of Turkey. Uh, they, they were people of Indo-European origin. Uh, we might consider what that means for a second, right? Indo-European, really referring to a family of languages, right? Uh, that have a common point of origin that was probably based in Central Asia, right? But as people migrated out of Central Asia, uh, some of them headed south, right? And they brought with them uh, the base of what would eventually merge as the various languages spoken in India. Uh, and then some of them headed west, right? Some of them would end up settling in uh, on the Iranian plateau, uh, so eventually providing the basis for uh, the, the Persian uh, people and the, the language they speak, Farsi, right? But others would continue to migrate further west, uh, some of them becoming the Hittites, though they would eventually uh, intermingle with whatever people they found there. Uh, and then many of them eventually making their way to Europe, right? So, uh, and as these people moved, and as they also moved away from one another, the, the languages they spoke would, would begin to evolve in different directions, right? Eventually becoming distinct languages, but they all share, again, this common point of origin. Uh, but pretty much all of the languages that you find in Europe today uh, belong to this family, Indo-European languages, right? Like German, uh, Latin-based languages like French, and that reflects kind of like a you know, further subdivision within this family of languages and so forth. Uh, but, but other Indo-European languages would include Persian, uh, i.e. Farsi, uh, also Sanskrit, uh, which is spoken in India and so forth, right? Uh, all of these people having a common point of origin in Central Asia. Uh, but in the case of the Hittites, right, it's around 2000 BCE that they had begun migrating towards Europe, India, and the Near East, uh, and then some settling in Asia Minor or Anatolia. Those are the geographic terms referring to roughly what corresponds to the uh, modern nation state of Turkey. Uh, and in the case of those who settled in Anatolia, again, eventually intermingling with the various peoples they found there. And this became the basis of the Hittite kingdom, uh, which really begins around 1700 BCE. Right? And just to kind of you know, give you an idea about you know, where we're talking about, right? the Hittite kingdom, uh, roughly you know, corresponding to the eastern half of the modern nation state of Turkey, uh, but spilling over into territory that today is part of Syria. The most famous ruler of the Hittites, and this is, uh, of all the names we've looked at, this is the one that gives me the most trouble, uh, would be Supi Luliumas I, and I'm not going to try that again, ruled from 1370 to 1330 BC. This was kind of the high watermark, uh, the glory period of the Hittites, right? So, you know, up until this point, uh, you know, this is well after they had been founded, right? So they had been kind of uh, developing as an imperial power, one that would eventually rival Egypt, right? Uh, and then the Hittites as an imperial power, right? Building an empire, extending into northern Syria, which eventually brought them into conflict uh, with Egypt, right? Though, uh, you know, it, it wasn't always conflictual. We already talked about kind of, you know, the peace treaty, eventually forming an alliance with Egypt. Uh, and then deciding how to divide the territory uh, of Syria between them. One factor really worth highlighting with respect to the Hittites' military success, they were the first Indo-European people to use iron, which allowed them to construct uh, both stronger and cheaper weapons, right? Uh, a lot of this simply reflected the fact that they had uh, a lot of iron ore on their territory. Uh, Egyptians are not Indo, uh, an Indo-European people, right? Remember, this is kind of a linguistic uh, designation, but in any event, not much going on there uh, 
uh, with iron up until around 600 BCE, right? So that did give them a certain advantage. Uh, but at the end of the day, right, just by way of, of summarizing, you know, they were kind of the uh, two superpowers of their day, you know, so and, and much like what happened in the 20th century with the United States and Soviet Union, eventually uh, defining respective spheres of influence that allow them to peacefully coexist, you know, even if it was a relatively cold peace, uh, such that uh, the previously referred to peace treaty might might be better characterized as a non-aggression pact. And that brings us to the end of the Hittites and the end of this lecture. Uh, Hittites, uh, again, the Sea Peoples are going to feature prominently, but there was also some issues of internal conflict uh, such that the Hittites go into decline uh, rather precipitously, very rapid decline, starting around 1200 BCE. And so again, that brings us to the end of this lecture. Uh, the follow-up uh, ancient Civilizations II will correspond to the second chapter from the textbook.